Welcome everyone. It is my great pleasure to bring back to the audience of librarians and educators and publishers and authors that follow Perspectives in Reading, one of our favorite authors and also a hometown native, Susan Orlean, to discuss her new book on animals. Welcome, Susan. I'm thrilled to be with you. Well, I can't tell you how excited I was when you agreed to set aside some time to talk about this wonderful piece of work, which I'm thoroughly enjoying. I've enjoyed it as an ebook. I own it in print. And when I heard that you narrated, I said, we got to listen to that too, because there are so many stories and chapters in this that you really have the benefit of hearing Susan at many speeds, by the way. If it's a chapter you've read, you could speed her up a little bit on the audiobook from Overdrive. But thank you for agreeing to discuss this with us. Where are you today, by the way? I am, it looks like I'm in Fiji, I think, but I am in my backyard in Los Angeles, um, enjoying, I mean, I have a little office that is um, out in our courtyard and it's a really magical place to work. Well, I can tell you that I had so many questions about your life and your care and feeding of animals, and you have to wait to the end of the book to really get the full story, because I'm, I'm keeping a running tab on your current pets and the growing menagerie, and you're, you know, I'm glad you didn't buy the uh, donkey in Morocco. I mean, that would have been too much for me to try and digest as you're uh, building your 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 Hudson-based, uh, um, you know, menagerie in New York. But but I'm going to first ask you, what inspired you at this time? to pull together these stories and share your your lifelong love and, and, and relationship with animals? You know, this is, uh, I mean, p publishing a collection is always a, a particularly satisfying experience for a writer. I think you look back over a body of work and select pieces that for one reason or another, you really want to see together in the form of a book. To be honest with you, I think the pandemic had something to do with that. I think this was a period of time when we were all, two things occurred. One is I got a puppy and, and I began thinking, why is this impulse in a moment of real crisis and anxiety, why is buying a puppy the first thing that comes to mind and i'm not the only person I, I, almost everyone i knew got a dog during covid and secondly i was feeling very reflective as i think we were all feeling at you know in a moment of crisis thinking what what is life all about what have i done that i feel proud of what what is the 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 point of my hard work, it occurred to me at that point that I had written in the course of my long career, I had revisited the subject of animals over and over again and very different stories. Everything from my own story of living on a farm to more journalistic stories like the story of Keiko, the whale who was in the Free Willy movies and the saga of his life. Um, I've revisited the subject of the human animal bond over and over again. It struck me that putting these pieces together would be a sum that was greater than the individual parts. Well, I can tell you, and we're chatting right now, it's a few days before Christmas. This is an ideal Christmas present, this, this book, because I was referencing just so many folks that I was preparing to um, chat with you about it. And everyone is an animal lover. They, they, they infatuated with their dogs or their cats or, and, and this, this book is such a beautiful 
um, gift to all animal lovers, as well as all of these short stories make it really a convenient, um, I call it right. a therapy book. You right. want to feel good about yourself, open a chapter, and then it'll make you feel a lot better. So. And when, well, thank you for that. And I do think that collections have this great quality, which is their bite size. Um, you can read one section and because it's not continuous, you don't feel that. I mean, it's much more like listening to one episode of a podcast. The, the, it it's, fits very comfortably in your reading life well in the tradition of your journalistic um investigative uh, body of work i still had to go to the dictionary i still had to stop this is why sometimes the audiobook i can't i can't i sometimes have to see the phrases and words and i go really i mean um i wrote down a few things that i had to stop on um you know, I didn't know there would be a contest for the best moose septum of the taxidermist. Or, you know, I when you talked about the prosecution of the killer of Victor the Lobster, I mean, you just have to stop <laughs> and say, I read that wrong. I'm in the chapter on tigers in New Jersey. <laughs> How did I find out in the aquarium in Oregon where there's the prosecutor who is going to punish the scoundrel that took Victor and caused him a three day slow death and couldn't be rescued by the lobster veterinarian? I mean, uh, well, what I what I enjoy the most is writing in a conversational way. And I think that a good conversationalist keeps you on the subject but often takes detours and there you know you you detour into a, a sort of detail that is in itself fascinating and the story of victor the lobster which was in itself a great story but it, what was fascinating is that it set precedent for animal law and animal law was very relevant to the story that I was writing about this woman in New Jersey with 27 pet tigers. <laughs> no, I, I got there. And by the way, you come back to the topic of law when you get into the the rules and regulations in your in your uh, L.A. Uh, community there for TV and movie. And <laughs> I really was surprised. Was it the fish lobbyists who said, no, they can only do three takes a day. The right. fish can only do three takes in, in a 24 hour period. <laughs> Yeah, because their lips get sore if you keep, you know, you need to show someone catching a fish in a film and you catch it and then you do another take and you catch it again. And their feeling is more than three times. It's not it's not fair. It, it, well, they're tired. I, I'm sure I have some friends and some that are listening. They also feel that they know cockroaches are protected on every set as a matter of law. So, um, uh, that, you know, there, there are so many delightful, funny things in the book. And, and you also give us a, a real global perspective, which is really uh, for, for our readers. You know, that's what books do. Books allow you to go explore. And, and you know, I got to tell you, I grew up with friends whose parents had homing pigeons, but oh, never really you. understanding the origin or... I had a Google. Was it still illegal to have a pet rabbit in Australia? Because I was talking to my partners in, in, in Melbourne, you know, before you. And I didn't realize those laws are still in the book because of the 500 million rabbit deaths that you right. article in the book. And that that was one of the most interesting of the stories that I wrote. And that was the one that I wrote at the beginning of COVID about this devastating virus that's spreading through the rabid population of the world. And to be honest, I hadn't given much thought to rabbits before this. <laughs> and <laughs> excuse me, they they are on every continent. And in Australia, they 
the the explosion of rabbits there and they were not na- native to australia but the explosion of rabbits there was the fastest spread known of any mammal in the history of the world i i when i confirm that several provinces it's still illegal unless you have an exemption for a show rabbit I mean, yeah, that's part of their history and legacy. It's just like I didn't expect to be learning about the Tennessee mule economy, yeah. um, which started in Afghanistan, obviously. We're in Afghanistan, and we're learning about the capabilities of that sturdy breed. But, you know, um, I have a lot of friends, and we do a lot of business in Tennessee, and I'm going to be asking uh, maybe John Ingram, uh, is his family having a piece of that action there still? I don't know. Yeah, well, it was, it was in a boom. It was a briefly booming economy when the U.S. Army decided to ship mules to Afghanistan. And I have to say, in retrospect, the absurdity of this enterprise is just <laughs> astonishing um the idea you know there are a lot of donkeys in places like like afghanistan and the advantage of mules is they're bigger and stronger and supposedly more trainable but the the whole episode was a little bit of like a crazy folly and the smart farmers of tennessee made some nice money selling their their mules to the u.s army well you explain at the end of the book your transition you got into the seasonality of a summer in new york and most of the year in la and then some of the transition but it sounds like there was a period there where you just couldn't say no And when you were getting practical, when the deer were bringing ticks onto the property and you got the guinea fowl thinking they would uh, consume all the ticks, I just wanted to know. And then, you know, you had that night where all of your fowl were, you know, the night of the massacre of the fowl. But at the height of it, did your husband and you ever just just wake up one day and say, my arms are sore from carrying water. Uh, I, I What have I done? I mean, sometimes we have to admit, maybe I got it a little too deep in my passion. Did that ever happen? You know, when when we had when we had our maximum number, absolutely. You know, there was a feeling that we were running a circus. Although, <laughs> I have to say we enjoyed it so much. The time you realize, though, is when you think, oh, I want to go away for the weekend. And we all know if you have a dog, you think, OK, I've got to arrange for the dog to be cared for while I'm away. When you have 10 black Angus cattle and ducks and geese and chickens and guinea fowl and dogs and cat. It's a whole different thing. Um, I found recently this printout that I made for our house sitters about how to take care of all the animals. And I'm amazed we ever had anyone agree (laughs) because it was just, it was a lot of work. Um, And it means that you are very grounded in your habitat the more animals you have the harder it is for you to say hey let's just spontaneously go away for the weekend well thank you for this gift to all of us we all are still so proud of the library book which has uh, been an inspiration for a new generation of librarians, information professionals, and of course, our dear friends at Los Angeles Public Library, how you told their story so well, and the intertwining of the search for the arsonist. Um, it's really something that, go out and buy the book, use your library card, get on a wait list, maybe Libby Lucky Day feature, will get it for you quicker. The ebook, the audio book, you need to hear Susan tell her story. And I want to thank you, Susan, for sharing with us a little bit more color on your new work. And congratulations on this uh, best-selling piece of nonfiction that is something everyone can enjoy. Thank you. It's so great to be with you. And, And of course, speaking to 
everybody um, in your audience who is passionate about books. It makes me very happy. 